Please remain standing for the reading of God's word from Matthew 26, verse 57 to 75. Matthew 26, 57 to 75. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And he went out to the entrance. And another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. That's the word of God for God's people today. You may be seated. And I know we usually say something along those lines, and it can become rote, but those truly are God's word for God's people today. And we do pray once again to ask for his help, because we need his help Not only to hear his word, but to have it planted deep within us, to have it change us, to have God work mightily amongst us this day by his spirit. So let's pray and ask him for his help. Father, in these dark moments of this last night before his crucifixion on earth, we pray you would give us eyes to see Jesus. That what we do not know, you would teach us. That what we do not yet have, you would give us in Christ. And what we are not yet, you would continue to make us, either new or renew us, into the image of the glory of Jesus, which we are now to behold. So help us, we pray, for the glory of your name. Amen. When you were young, were you afraid of the dark? Now that you're not young, are you still afraid of the dark? (laughs) If you're young, are you afraid at night? Uh, Uncertainty accompanies night because we don't know what might lurk in the shadows, depending on how your imagination is, because there's not enough light to see. And even if you're no longer afraid of the dark, Knowing there's nothing physically lurking in the shadows, there are those nights where we lie awake battling the shadows of the what-ifs of life as we toss and turn in the night. But no matter what we might feel about nighttime, there is one certainty about the night that we can know amidst its chaos and uncertainty. Morning will come. That light will break through. Dawn isn't too far away. And the Bible actually begins in darkness. It begins in a dark night with chaos abounding. The creation account is ordered not how we order our days from morning to night, but from 
evening and morning, there was the first day, right? That creation account moves every evening into the morning. And we see that pattern as then a few chapters later, God speaks to Abraham at night in Genesis 15. And he takes him outside to look at the stars and promise that even though Abram had no children at that point, his offspring would be as numerous as not the clouds in the sky in the daytime, but as numerous as the stars in the night sky. And then God made his covenant with Abram when a great and dreadful darkness fell upon him. God promised in that dreadful darkness that Abram's offspring would inherit the promised land. Well, hundreds of years later, we come to another night. Israel is in, oppressed in, in slavery in Egypt, and God comes to rescue them by coming against Egypt and Pharaoh with plagues. And the last plague was the plague of death. And that plague came on their last night in Egypt when they ate the Passover meal in houses where the lamb's blood they had slaughtered was still fresh and dripping on the doorposts. And while the angel of death stalked every firstborn of families that were not trusting in God's Passover promise, in the darkness all around them, they heard the shrieks and wails of death. In the chaos of that night, we read they packed up and plundered the Egyptians and began their journey to the promised land. The next time we encounter the word night in the Exodus story, even though it's not consecutive days, uh, we're, we come to the word night when they're about to cross the Red Sea. So what we're supposed to see is Exodus 12 and 14 are one day, quote-unquote. It's one saving day. The saving act is supposed to be read together. And we see another night when the Pharaoh and his mighty army are in hot pursuit with the Red Sea in front of Israel. And the chaos of that night then includes east wind blowing, uh, waters miraculously parting, seabeds dry as concrete, and we have this faith alongside fear. It's faith in God who first parts the water, would keep those waters parted as they're walking through it. But the palpable fear that we read about in Exodus 14 is they sense and feel the raging army of Pharaoh breathing down their necks. Now, we don't read the word morning on the day after the Passover meal. The next time we read the word morning is after they cross the Red Sea. It's during the morning watch that God throws the mighty Egyptian army into a panic and brings down the walls of water upon them. It's after they endured the night by grace and faith in God when morning came, we read that they looked upon the corpses of their enemies on the seashore while they stood on the other side by God's great love and power saved. And we see this pattern that begins in Genesis, this moving from evening to morning, that after the night chaos breaks, the dawn of joy and life. And that's why in the Psalms, in verse uh, 30, or excuse me, 5 of Psalm 30, we read, reaping may tarry for the night, but what? Morning comes, the joy comes in the morning. The only problem with that is there's nights when we have to weep. <laughs> Before morning comes, you must endure the night. But as we've seen this pattern, morning always comes. And so it is no surprise that when Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the first Passover lamb, those thousands of years earlier, heads out into the night, what do we find him facing? He has enemies seeking to kill and destroy him breathing down his neck. They come against Jesus with an armed mob, and having been betrayed by Judas, they've seized him and brought him to stand before the Sanhedrin. The Jewish Supreme Court was comprised of probably about 70 Jewish leaders. And so I want us to see four things about this long night that Jesus endures before the, the dawn of salvation can break. Four things. First, we see Jesus accused. Jesus accused. 
We all know something about being accused, and it's usually, or it's one thing when we're accused uh, of something we deserve because we've done it. You know, there's not much injustice about being accused for something you've done. But we all feel something well up deep within us when we read in verse 59 that it wasn't witnesses coming to the Sanhedrin with evidence of Jesus' sin, but rather that the Sanhedrin had sought false witnesses against Jesus so they could kill him. They were seeking this. They wanted it. It was their mission not for the truth, but for false witnesses to murder Jesus. And as Jesus had said just days earlier in his confrontation with the leaders in Matthew 23, we see it playing out here. They're blind guides who tithe 10% of their kitchen spices, but they neglect the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so here they commit injustice in God's name while blatantly breaking God's ninth commandment against his very own son. You shall not bear false witness. And as Jesus had taught us earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, that the law is just not about what not to do, right? You've killed a person if you've been angry at them. You've committed adultery if you've lusted. So again, it's heart. Heart matters here. Not just about what you're not supposed to do, but what the law also teaches us to do. So rather than just not bearing false witness, these leaders should be upholding the standard of, of justice for true witness. But they're blatantly breaking the ninth commandment. And you can even hear them kind of rationalize the evil proceedings by saying something like, well, we're not bearing false witness. It's these guys. But they're the ones orchestrating it all. But even in this night's chaotic moments, we see who really is in control, who's really behind it all. It's God who sovereignly unfolds his plan, even in the chaos of the night. Though they've seized Jesus and brought him here, we saw last week that it's really Jesus who has come here on his own will, right? Uh, he could have avoided Gethsemane, but he set his face to go to the cross. He could have snuck out into the darkness another way, but he chose to go towards the angry mob. He could have called down 12 legions of angels to protect him and to save him, but he went as it was planned by God and prophesied in the scriptures to save his people from their sins. And the evidence of God's sovereignty and man's just pure, complete impotence to do anything outside God's sovereign power is seen here as though they were dead set on killing Jesus and they were dead set on seeking false witnesses against him they still couldn't find any. Isn't, does that not amaze you? Have you ever felt like that? Maybe not like this exactly, but I just mean like, have you ever felt like all your best laid plans and everything you did, it's just not happening? No matter what you do, all your good intentions and all the great planning, you just can't make it come to fruition. Well, even here, dead set, a group of 70 people trying their hardest to find false testimony to put Jesus to death, they couldn't find any. And that not only reveals Jesus' complete innocence and the absolute injustice he's enduring here, but it also reminds us that God is in complete control, that these people, these men, this court is not going to find one false witness before God allows. I like how Charles Spurgeon once preached it. He said this, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam, you know what he's talking about, right? When the sun comes in through the window and you can just see the little floaties that all of a sudden you realize you've been breathing, right? It's like, they don't move an atom more or less than God wishes. So if dust in the sunlight's not going to move an atom more or less outside God's control, they're not finding false witnesses until God allows. And so when these two witnesses come forward, we're not shocked because God is still in complete control. We're not shocked that they falsely testify that Jesus said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Well, what's false about that? It's because they're misquoting him. Jesus didn't actually say that. What we read in, in John 2 is that Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. So it's kind of like, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up three days later. 
And not only that, John tells us that while everyone else thought he was talking about the physical temple, Jesus was talking about his body. And so they falsely quoted Jesus so that his words will convey a kind of terrorism against a holy place. And in doing so, they could report to Rome that Jesus is rebellious, he's seditious, he has evil intentions, he's trying to stir up problems, and Rome is always happy to snuff out problems. And so as his enemies close in around him, as the walls of injustice tower above him, Jesus, even though he is completely innocent, is standing accused. And in that moment, then we see, secondly, Jesus silent. Jesus silent. It's pretty remarkable when we don't read in verse 62 a response from Jesus. It's, it's meant to be kind of shocking that the first person who talks when this serious charge is leveled against him is not Jesus, but Caiaphas. It seems Caiaphas even expected Jesus to respond to the testimony at this point because rather than Jesus speaking, it's Caiaphas who breaks the silence. He's like, are you not going to say anything? Have you nothing to say to this? No, the whole room knew the serious nature of these charges, that if they could prove it, Jesus was a dead man. And everyone had probably given Jesus a pass during the earlier moments of this trial. Jesus hadn't said anything at all. Why all of a sudden does it come to a head here? Well, even every, everyone in the room already knew, you know, how bad the testimonies were before this. They weren't even worthy of a response. I mean, even the Sanhedrin knew they hadn't come up with anything yet. But here, with this serious charge on the table, with his life on the line, they expected Jesus to interject that the witnesses were wrong. Or, at the very least, misquoting him or misunderstood him, and he could clarify his statement. But Jesus remained silent. Silent in the face of these injustice, silent as he stands accused. Well, when something has left a mess in our house, and, and I walk into that room, I'll usually say something like, Who left their junk all over the place? And I'll say it loud enough so all three kids can hear. And inevitably, every time, without fail, who speaks first? Not the one who left the mess, but one of the ones that didn't. And they are very quick to tell me what? Wasn't me? And they back slowly out of the room, right? <laughs> Wasn't me? Now, we don't remain silent even when we're not personally accused and someone is just asking a question. We're very quick to defend ourselves, let alone remain silent when we are accused by name. And I've never had this uh, happen to me, but charges and an accusation that could lead to death if something or someone doesn't step in to defend me. But Jesus remains silent. But I want us to see that this is actually a response. He, Jesus isn't not doing nothing. He's not saying, wasn't me, just silently. Jesus' silence is a response for those with eyes to see. Remember, th these guys running the show here are blind guides, Jesus tells us. They can't see what Jesus' silence means. Blind Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin can't see what's right in front of them. They should. They're Israel's leaders. They should know the prophecies. And the prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 is being fulfilled in their very sight, and they can't see it. What does Isaiah 53 say? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so Jesus' silence, yes, symbolized that no genuine charge had still been uttered in this trial. But his silence also symbolizes something more than just his innocence. It's that he is the suffering servant 
of Isaiah 53. It's being fulfilled in their presence, in their very sight, and they can't see it. But it doesn't just reveal that Jesus will be silent like Isaiah's servant, but that also Jesus will fulfill all the prophecy concerning this servant, like these ones from verses 5 and 9. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. This is why Jesus remains silent. It's not that he's not doing anything. He's fulfilling the prophecy. He's showing us what kind of Savior he is, what kind of Messiah he is, what the Son of Man is, who the Son of God is, and what he has come to do. And there are times when silence speaks volumes, aren't there? But only for those with ears to hear. And the Sanhedrin didn't hear Jesus' silent message this night. So do you. Do you hear it? Can you see what his silence means. Jesus is not under trial for his sins. He was pierced for our transgressions. He endured the violence and oppression that began this night because it was God the Father's will, Isaiah 53, verse 10 says. It was his Father's will to crush his only beloved Son for our sins, to make his death and put him in the grave that we deserved, even though there was no deceit in his mouth. And he did it for our sins, to love and save us back to himself. That's why Jesus stands here and endures this. Jesus knowingly came to earth to be the Passover lamb, to be the lamb led to the slaughter, to open not his mouth, even in defense of himself, because he has come to save his people from their sins. On this dark night, the light shines on our Savior. And even though Jesus doesn't open his mouth, Caiaphas does, which leads us to see, thirdly, Jesus condemned. Jesus condemned. In his frustration with how the night has gone so far, you can feel it building. They haven't been able to find witnesses. Now they find a couple. When they finally do, Jesus isn't talking. He's getting upset and more upset. And so he finally puts Jesus under oath in the trial and demands he speak. He says, I adjure you. He's putting him on oath in the trial to enter his official testimony into the record. But when he does this, he does it with a trap. You see the trap there? He says, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Well, no matter how Jesus answers, he's in trouble, isn't he? If he says he's the Messiah, well, they'll turn him over to Rome and says he's uh, about to lead a rebellion. You need to put him down. If he says he's the son of God, they'll just accuse him of blasphemy, and then they'll give him to Rome, and they'll put him down. So either way, they think they have Jesus here finally wrapped up with a bow on him, going to get what they had hoped for when the night began. But Jesus answers with such amazing wisdom. He says, you have said so. Well, we've seen that before, but again, you have said all this. This is Proverbs 30 playing out before us. When words abound, sin abounds. When words are many, sin is unavoidable. You might, however your translation might put it. When words are many, sin is creeping and crouching. But the one who restrains his tongue is wise. So Jesus says, you're the, you are the people who have been talking all night. You've, you're the ones that are saying all this. You have said so. It's such poise in a dark night. He's not going to play their game. But he still will speak with authority and truth because that's not all he says. He says, you have said so. But now that he is under oath, he testifies to who he truly is. He says, you said this, but now let me tell you it. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus says, I am the Son of Man that you've read about in Daniel 7. I am God's Son. I will come on the clouds of heaven. 
and I will be the one who will receive an eternal, universal kingdom from the hand of the Ancient of Days. I will rule over all peoples for eternity in righteousness and justice, which with this night has none of. The one they judge this night then replies to them that, they, that he will one day sit on the throne of eternal power and judge them. It's kind of laughable in the moment. He's bound. He hasn't said anything. He looks weak. But in this moment, in this moment, he testifies that one day soon he will conquer and judge evil once and for all. But when Jesus is condemned here, our picture isn't just of Jesus' power. Jesus testifies of his power, but what's the context of this testimony? We see it's not just of Jesus' power, but he also testifies to how he will save his people. How will Jesus be the one who saves and not only judges? How will Jesus be the one who will save his people instead of judging them as their sins deserve? Well, when Jesus, the true and faithful witness, testifies that he is God— what do we see Caiaphas doing to his robe? He tears it. Now, you might think he's just overcome, and maybe it's very dramatic, and he's trying to get everyone to see just the awful nature of this testimony he deems as blasphemous. But, but what Caiaphas does is actually against the law himself. In Leviticus 21, when God is setting out uh, laws for the priest he tells them not to tear the robe he says i'm sanctifying you uh, not making holy in, in the sense that we typically think of sanctification but sanctifying as in setting apart when god sets apart aaron's sons as uh, priests he says you cannot tear the robes that i set you apart in because it's a symbolic rejection of the priesthood when, when Aaron tears a robe, it's like rejecting God and saying, I'm, I don't care that you've set me apart. I want no part of this. So the tearing of the robe is a symbolic rejection of God setting him apart. So on the night when the high priest condemns God's very son to death, the high priest actually breaks the law and rejects the priesthood. That is, he's a lawbreaker. And just like everyone else now in the room, even the one who should be above the fray has sinned. Everyone in the room is a sinner. And now clearly in sin, that is everyone else except Jesus. No charge has stuck. He is completely innocent. He is the only one in the room without sin, as the high priest has clearly now revealed. And as the high priest symbolically renounces the priesthood in this moment, what we're meant to see is that the only priest who actually remains is Jesus. There is no one else who can deal with our sin. There is no one else who can deal with the uncleanness that is uh, on us and in us. Jesus is though now the one clearly set apart by God to deal with his people's sin. Jesus, as Hebrews will then go on to teach, is our true high priest who takes away our uncleanness, not just for a moment and not just by one act on one day that we have to keep doing over and over and over because lambs and bulls and goats' blood cannot cover our sins. So he, our high priest, will take our uncleanness away, not just, not just for a moment, but once and for all. He's the high priest who will stand in his people's place and shed his own blood once and for all to cover our sins. He will do it as the lamb led to the slaughter, as he himself will stand in our place condemned and shed his blood for all those who believe in him. It's amazing in this dark night that we see God at work to reveal our true high priest. It's Jesus. But even in this moment, when God is still at work, the dawn of salvation is still a long ways off. And they begin to beat him. 
and spit on him. And I've never been spit upon, but I can imagine it's probably the most vile thing that you could endure from another human being. And then they slap him. And then it tells us that they begin mocking him, saying, prophesy to us who's hitting you. Which I imagine is probably because getting punched in the face and spit upon, Jesus probably had his eyes closed. So what they're saying is, as your eyes are closed, if you're really the Christ, prove it. They're literally fulfilling the prophecies and mocking the only one who can save them. <laughs> and that irony should not be lost on us. That he's already proven it. That he's fulfilling the prophecies right away that they're mocking about him. But what we see here is it's not just the world rejecting Jesus on this night. Because then we see next, and finally, fourthly, Jesus denied. Jesus denied. As Jesus was inside with his enemies raging around him, Peter was outside with the guards in the courtyard. And if you go back to verse uh, 58, what Peter has probably come into the courtyard to do is in one sense to see Jesus die and in could be, I, I take it to mean he doesn't believe Jesus will rise again, at least in this moment. Look at the end of verse 58. He, he went inside the courtyards and sat with the guards to see the end. I mean, in, in, in one sense, he, he, he knows this is Jesus' end. He, he's surrounded, his enemies are all around him, and he's given up hope that Jesus will be resurrected. This is the end. And so here we have Peter, one of his closest friends who just took up a sword to try and save him, now saying, well, it's all done. But he's still here. We want to give Peter credit. He is the only disciple who hasn't fled so far. But we know the prophecy that's coming. And so a servant girl, while Jesus was, or excuse me, while Peter um, was sitting at the gate, or at the, in the courtyard, uh, said he was with Jesus, and Peter denied it. Then he moves to the gate, where another servant girl says to all the people in the courtyard that Peter was with Jesus, and he had denied it again. But this time, Peter takes up an oath. And we're meant to see the irony. Jesus, Jesus only goes to oath-taking, and he didn't even take it. He was forced into it when it was thrust upon him. Peter's more than happy to all of a sudden take an oath, you know? Peter's already throwing Jesus' words on, uh, out the window. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so while our pure, innocent Savior is suffering and not going to take an oath and remain silent, his own people are taking oaths, but oaths to deny him. Whereas Jesus had this oath thrust upon him, Peter jumped at the chance to swear, I don't even know him. And then finally, the group said they knew Peter was with Jesus because his Galilean accent gave him away. And so then he invoked curses upon himself and swore that he didn't know Jesus. And as soon as that last word leaves his mouth, what happens? Immediately, immediately, the rooster crows. And Peter remembered what Jesus had just told him, maybe mere hours before, in Gethsemane. Yeah, you're not going to flee but you're going to deny me three times before morning breaks. And Luke tells us in this moment of Peter's denial that Jesus and Peter's eyes met across the courtyard. And I wonder what you think Peter saw in those eyes. In the depth of this moment, with the prophecies fulfilled, and Peter's sin is on full display. What do you think Peter saw when he and Jesus' eyes locked across the courtyard? Contempt? I told you so. Disappointment? And our day would maybe be this look of, I'm done with you, you're canceled. 
never going to have anything to do with you again type of look. But we're told in the New Testament that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. Meaning, Jesus is God in the flesh. And so, we can know what Peter saw in Jesus. What Peter saw in Jesus' eyes. From the pages of Scripture and God's self-revelation about himself. This is what I thought, and this is what I think Peter saw in Jesus' eyes. Listen to Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. And it means sinful thousands. Because he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And I don't know about you, but considering just the four short decades of my life so far, I'm glad that I can look into a Savior's eyes like this and see steadfast love and a slow to anger forgiveness in them. That's our only hope. And Peter saw compassion in Jesus' eyes. He saw steadfast love and forgiveness in Jesus' eyes. Eyes that promised forgiveness of sins. Because as we know from Exodus 34, God forgives iniquity and sin and transgression, not by clearing the guilty. By no means will God clear the guilty. So how will he forgive? He doesn't clear the guilty he bears the guilt upon himself to forgive us. And so you might wonder why, if Peter saw this in Jesus, why did he go out and weep blindly? Well, if you remember from chapter 26 earlier, Jesus says, when you do, I'm going to go before you. I think in this moment, Jesus, Peter, Peter got saved <laughs> in the one sense. Peter started believing. He, he wept bitterly because he saw his own sin. And he goes out because Jesus said, I will go before you. Just a, just a few verses earlier. He says, when you fail, I will go before you. Now all Peter's hope is in Jesus. So G Peter is weeping bitterly too, though. So he goes out because I think something has changed when he locked eyes with Jesus and he has gone out to meet Jesus. Jesus said, he's going before me. That's my only hope. And he's weeping bitterly. But if he is believing in Jesus and he's going out to meet Jesus because this isn't the end, but Jesus will meet and go before him, why is he weeping bitterly? He should be happy. Why is he weeping bitterly? Well, I think Thomas Watson, a Puritan pastor, helps us understand. He says this, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. I think in this moment, Peter started hating his sin. Sin became real bitter when he saw what it took for Jesus to love and save him back to himself. It's not that Peter wept because he didn't see forgiveness in Jesus' eyes. Peter weeps bitter, bitterly because he has finally realized how sinful he really is. And how great a savior he really needs. And have you ever wept at the depth of your sin? Have you ever been disgusted with the ugliness of it? Have you come to these moments where you see that you have a great need for a great savior? That you have no hope without one? And I think that's why Matthew 26 ends with Jesus all alone. Of course, he's fulfilling prophecies. So maybe it's better to say this is one reason why Jesus stands alone at the end of Matthew 26. Not to highlight Peter's denial, nor his weeping, nor to highlight the world's rejection and condemnation of Jesus, which are all true. No, Jesus stands alone so that we see he is the only one that can save. 
Religion can't save us. There is no priesthood now. You can't save you. You have no hope in yourself. Even your bitter weeping cannot save you. You cannot feel bad enough or do enough to assuage your guilt and pay for it. Jesus stands alone so that you see he is the only one who can save. Because we're all lawbreakers and we all deserve death. We can't save ourselves, and not even our bitterest tears can remove their guilt and shame of our sin. And even if we first believe in Jesus, if we're left to ourselves, we know the sin of the old man that still lives deep within, and I will not keep on believing or keep on holding on to Christ if he doesn't hold me fast. But that's where the good news of Matthew 26 begins. That it's not the strength of our believing nor is it the most help, heartfelt tears that can save us. It's not the vehemence of our denying or the depth of any of our sins that make us unable for God to save us. Do you see? It's not Peter's tears that save him, and it's not, and, and his depth of denial doesn't make him unsavable. That's the point, that really there is nothing that we can do and no one else to save but Jesus. And that's the good news. Simply Jesus saves. Jesus saves. No sin can take us out of God's saving reach, and no sinner Jesus saves can ever be lost. He's the true high priest. His blood covers all the sins of his people. And so Jesus stands alone at the end of Matthew 26 so that we find our hope in him alone. But it's in the depth of the brokenness and chaos of this night that we come to see that message. That Jesus had to stand alone before we could hope in him alone. And so friends, when it comes to sin, what the end of Matthew 26 teaches us is that you can do one of two things. You can either dig in like the Sanhedrin and the guards and mock and reject Jesus and go about your merry way. Or you can weep over your sin like Peter and believe in Jesus. Those are the two ways that you can deal with sin. And I pray God's grace moves you to come to the one who endured such a night so that we might see the dawn of salvation. And brothers and sisters, may we make Jesus our great treasure, our only aim, and our sole hope. And we can do that as we find him our, as Thomas Watson wrote, our delicious good. That you will never run out of happiness if you feast on Jesus. So make Jesus our great treasure so that he becomes so sweet that sin becomes more and more bitter and hope in Christ alone. And we can hope in Christ alone because we know that no matter how dark the night gets, joy comes in the morning. Let's pray. Well, Father, we confess that without this man of sorrows, we would have no hope. That if he didn't stand silent as he was accused, he wouldn't have been fulfilling scripture. That if he wouldn't have been brought before the priests, we wouldn't see him as our true high priest. That if we didn't see Peter's denials, we would be tempted to think that our sins take us too far out of your saving reach. So we praise you, Father, for sending your son and for your spirit's gift of faith in him for your spirit's power to unite us with him and for your spirit's power to seal us in him so that we are sure that no matter what happens because Christ is a great savior our inheritance is certain so we ask that this week you would make sin more bitter and give us taste buds that find our delicious good to be Jesus alone. 
And may we go out singing the praises of the one who endured such a dark night to bring us the dawn of salvation. Glorify your name in us and through us, we ask, as we exalt our Savior among our neighbors and the nations this week, we ask. Amen.